Hello, everyone. I'm Martha Suma Chadwick. I am a concert pianist and I am the executive director of a nonprofit advocating for the use of music in healthcare and therapy. The nonprofit name is Music Therapy Gateway in Communications. I became interested in music for therapeutic use many years ago when I was teaching uh, piano and I had a, a neurotypical student, but she had a sibling who was autistic. And over the years, we actually were able to work with music with this little girl at age four who was nonverbal and teach her how to not only read music, but her vocal elements all started coming together and she was able to mainstream into a normal classroom by second grade. That taught me the power of how important this really is. And that's when I decided to go ahead and dedicate um, a big chunk of my efforts to trying to move this through. So this particular concert is all about the power of music and this particular discussion, I'm really thrilled to have three really wonderful people who are top in their fields in music and education and medicine here to talk about all of this because we're gonna be talking about music in all of these various ways. So let's start with Bob Bernhardt. And Bob, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Bob Bernhardt and I began my career in the Jurassic period. How's that? <laughs> uh, I, uh, for around 40 years, was a, uh, a music director and conductor of five different organizations. Um, the last was 19 seasons with the Chattanooga Symphony and Opera. And um, I stepped down in 2011 and uh, started what basically became a, a, a new aspect of a career for me. I started specializing in the world of pops concerts. Uh, I'd been doing education and opera and ballet and symphony to that point. So for the last 10 years, it's been primarily in the pops world. Um, the, this particular discussion is, uh, I would say, um, timely in, in that we're coming up to the one year anniversary of the last concert I conducted. The pandemic has not only shifted everything, but also made me think uh, long and hard about why it is I do what I do and what really matters in what I do. And it really comes down to uh, communication. Well, I've, I've had the privilege of, of performing with Bob leading a few times um, in the past few years. And I can tell you, he's a wonderful communicator. Absolutely fabulous. You're too kind, thank you. We have Dr. Stuart Bankert here, and uh, Stuart and I have interacted a lot at UTC Indeed. with moving collaborative programs forward. Stuart, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I am Stuart Bankert, and I am the head of the Department of Performing Arts, which includes music and theater and the um, uh, concert halls. Uh, I started teaching K-12 in the Appalachian Mountains, to uh, students, some of whom did not have plumbing in their homes. And uh, music was, was a big part of their lives. In fact, for some of them, it was the only thing they had of, of any value outside of actual family relations. Um, then I went to uh, Kansas to get my, my doctorate. And that's the, the other commonality Martha and I have is that uh, I didn't even really know what music therapy was until I started my, my master's program and my PhD at Kansas where I learned music therapy. This is very personal for me uh, because my younger daughter has uh, autism and she is a percussionist in the local high school band and where she's treated, where she's taught by two of my former students, by the way, so I'm very <laughs> fortunate. And uh, uh, music is her life. If it weren't for music, um, she, she almost doesn't realize that she has to live with autism because of being in band and being in music. She um, um, uh, is surrounded by people who don't treat her like she has autism. And lots of times uh, uh, we're fortunate when we're around people who don't treat us uh, uh, like, like uh we're special or that we have needs. It's nice to just have people who treat us as people. 
And uh, that's been very, very beneficial to her. And as a dad, it's been very beneficial to me and as a music educator and obviously as a department head, so. We also now have Rick Rader. Dr. Rader is an incredible physician working with um, the fields of intellectual and developmental disability. Um, he's a good friend of mine. We have collaborated together many times over the past years on various projects to help to try to, to move the awareness of music into um, the medical world also. So Rick, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Rick Rader. And if my grandmother was still alive, she would say, tell him you're a doctor. So <laughs> let me redo that by saying I'm Dr. Rick Rader. Uh, and of course, I'm delighted to be with you, Martha and uh, Bob and Stuart, of course. Uh, you know, as a physician, we're always obligated to do a disclosure before we speak. And so I'd like to disclaim the fact that, or explain the fact that I am self-admittedly musically reclined. Um, I have failed with everything from castanets, tambourines, and kazoos. You can uh, conduct, Rick. You can conduct. <laughs> so it's pretty intimidating to be with these two big music mavens. Um, I'm a physician. I'm cross-trained in internal medicine and medical anthropology as well. So I have an appreciation for the biocultural determinants of health and disease. Uh, and also board certified in uh, field of neurodevelopmental disabilities, um, which is basically providing um, superlative care for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the lifespan. Um, I'm originally from New York and I've been in Chattanooga for the past 27 years. In 1994, while I was in New York, uh, I was actually uh, finishing my fellowship in psychoneuroimmunology with a concentration on stress medicine. I read a very seductive ad in a medical journal, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that some place, it was a blind post office box, um, was trying to recruit a physician to come to Chattanooga to start creating an innovative program of providing individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities superlative health care um, across the spectrum of health care, including oral health care, behavioral health care, um, psychosocial health care, et cetera. And being a sucker for the underdog, I basically jumped at the chance and have never looked back. Um, interestingly enough, the ad called for the director of habilitation. And I had never heard of that term. And I thought, well, this must be a misprint. I certainly heard of rehabilitation. And that was my first introduction to this strange and underserviced uh, um, population. So let me share that with you, because basically what we do is we practice habilitation medicine. So everybody's familiar with and comfortable with the concept of rehabilitation, which is the retraining of skills to people who lost those skills. They lost those skills either through um, the ravages of aging or basically neurodegenerative uh, diseases, Alzheimer's or, or trauma. Um, our folks, the folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities never had these skills to begin with. So we're not trying to basically retrain them. We're basically not trying to reconnect neurotransmitters that were once connected. We're basically trying to provide them with the training and skills and compensatory mechanisms that they need to try to navigate the world. Um, I wear a lot of different hats through my networking. And one of them, somehow I woke up one day here at Orange Grove and found myself to be the director or basically the overseer of our music program. And uh, that's been quite the learning experience. Um, I'm also editor-in-chief of Exceptional Parent Magazine, a magazine that's been uh, publishing for 50 years, uh, catering to providing knowledge and information and support to parents um, with, with children. And when I stage parents with children, we're talking about, you know, as longevity increase for this population, we now have children who are 50 and 60. So that's important. One of the, the, the pearls that I learned from communicating with parents over the last 25 years is the need for us to provide those children, okay, with enrichment programs and music basically rises to the surface of that. I'm also president of the American Association for Health and Disease, Health and Disability, and most notably um, received a presidential appointment to serve on the National Council on Disability. So um, that sort of allows me um, to get some inside, inside information about 
um, the power of, of uh, logistics and the power of legislation. And lastly, I'm on the uh, Global Medical Advisory Board of Special Olympics. And I can tell you being a Special Olympic physician, I can tell you watching the impact of music during competition, during training, and even when the athletes are waiting for their turn, that really, really makes a difference. So, uh, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. So when, you know, we, we all know and love music aesthetically, but we kind of understand music from a therapeutic standpoint. Let's actually look at it from a hundred thousand years ago. An ancient artwork tells us that music was an integral form of communication at that point. And the, the neuroscience at this point tells us that it is an evolutionary science also that the brain created the music, it interacts with the music, and then it grows further with the use of the music. So the use of music for therapy as an actual vocation started as a social science back following uh, World War II, when bands would go around and play uh, for the soldiers in the hospitals. And it was noticed that people felt better. But of course, they really didn't know how it all worked. They just knew they felt better. But music therapy began that way. And then it made a huge leap forward back in the 90s with the advent of imaging technology, such as the fMRI and EEG, where we can actually look directly into the brain as the music is being played and see how the brain is interacting with the music. And they found that it's an incredible thing because the brain is really active all the time that the music is going on. And the main thing therapeutically that really hits us is the rhythm. Uh, when you think about rhythm, it's really standard. You, you know, it's anticipatory, you know exactly what's happening with it. And it is intrinsic. We have rhythm going on in our heart rate. We have rhythm going on with how we walk. We have rhythm going on in our bodies all the time. And so rhythm can be an incredible thing to help with people who have motor speech or cognition challenges. So what I'm gonna do now is show just an example. If all of you guys and anybody watching this could just tap a, tap a finger on your lap, you know, or a tap a toe or something, find your own personal rhythm. And then what happens when I do this? Odds are likely your finger immediately started jumping into tapping right along with that rhythm. It takes about a minute or a second and a half to do this. Um, it's called entrainment and entrainment happens with the muscles. It happens with the brain oscillations. It happens with the heart rate. And so music can be a very powerful thing to help actually work with people who have all of these both rehabilitation and intellectual and developmental disability issues. And I truly do believe after working with this for so many years that music would actually revolutionize healthcare if we brought it into the mainstream of healthcare. I truly do believe that. So Rick, you have done an amazing amount of work clearly with, with your population. Can you tell us some of the specifics of what you've seen of what happens when these folks use music with their normal routines or to help them with tasks? Sure, let me, let me give you some background so you get a perspective of, of our role in the community. So Orange Grove was started in 1953 when there were no options for children with so-called mental retardation. Uh, the parents were advised by the physicians to quote, send them to an institution and concentrate on the normal ones. Luckily, uh, there was a group of visionary defiant and I guess very desperate parents that thought, no, we're not gonna do that. There has to be another way. And so they collaborated and created the Orange Grove Center, which was originally only a school because the longevity of folks with quote birth defects was not much more past the late teens. We currently basically um, support about a thousand individuals from about age six to age 90 uh, across the lifespan. And we are community based. So organically, we basically had to create the full array of supports. So we have medical, dental, OT, PT. We have speech and communications. We have residential, educational employment, behavioral supports. Very, very rigorous um, relationship with universities around the world. And they have their students at any one time during the semester. We have 15 to 18 UTC students representing probably 15 different disciplines. 
Um, and of course, the enrichment programs, which I mentioned earlier, music, art, theater, Special Olympics, because these programs, if we only if we only provided food, clothing, and shelter, we would basically only be custodial supports, and that's not we have what we've done for the last 68 years. And it's all been provided under the rubric of self-determination and supported decision-making. What I think is really most impressive is that we have established a center for the study of joy in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. To the best of our knowledge, it is the only one of its kind in the world. And basically what we do is we try to get a better understanding on how people with cognitive dif disabilities um, seek out, express, share, and benefit from joy. Our population has been studied up the kazoo, you know, with everything. I can tell you the impact of seizure disorders uh, and rainfall, but we couldn't say what makes them smile. Is it any different than what makes us smile? And so we take the insights that we've learned from studying joy and we try to incorporate them into any new programs and, prog and policies that, that we do. So that if my colleagues um, are entrusted to create a new program, one of the things I need them to do when they come back to report how it's going to be organized is when they say, Dr. Rader, this is the component that's going to provide joy. Now, you can't provide joy. You can only provide opportunities for people to experience and define joy for their own lives. Um, but music has provided many, many avenues for our folks to not only be in the community, but part of the community. We have singers and performers. They've done innumerable concerts. People living in Chattanooga know them well during the holidays, the presentations at colleges, at the airport, city hall, festivals. Our chorus even opened up for a concert with uh, Ricky Skaggs for over 25,000 people. And I dare say they stole the show. Uh, we know now that music is a great modality to learn social skills, to appreciate being part of something larger than themselves. And beyond the neurosciences, beyond the brain mapping that we do, beyond the functional MRIs, which you mentioned, and beyond its impact on the length of teleomeres, you know, those little guys that are hanging out at the end of chromosomes, um, music is simply omnipotent. And it is without a doubt what we, what we have as a change agent. So I think it was Elvis Costello, who, the, the other Elvis, you know, who said a song can infiltrate your heart and the heart may change your mind. Uh, and that's enough for us. Uh, music is an incredible tool for inclusion. And I think inclusion is really, really important also for all of us, but especially for this particular group that you work with. Can you talk a little bit about how important inclusion is? Sure. You know, one of the things we pride ourselves is the organization of the Orange Grove Choral Singers or the Chorus, which basically is invited all over the state. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to incorporate our singers to other singers without disabilities. And so uh, Carolyn, you know, through her efforts, has created opportunities for our singers to participate with other singers, barbershop, quartet you know, colleges, fraternities, et cetera, uh, bands. Um, and, you know, again, we don't perform in the community because we are the community. And music probably is, you know, the greatest transformer for people to get to know people. Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not you have cerebral palsy, whether or not have, you have autism, whether or not you have Down syndrome. If you're singing and dancing and you're tapping your feet, the person next to you will probably do the same thing as you just demonstrated. And so basically inclusion is what it's all about. Um, although the music is important, music serving as the bridge to inclusion is probably its major feature here, at least at Orange Grove. As things happened in the last two decades or so, the reasons we did concerts for children is because that may be the only time in their lives they'd hear a symphony orchestra. They would hear a live performance and uh, to know what that meant and that it, would, that it even existed in their lives. Um, as far as uh, uh, the in inclusion is concerned, we've been, my whole career, the thought of my career, what I think of my career, you can tell me what it is, but what I think of my career has been to try to break down any walls that keep people from hearing a symphony or hearing classical music or hearing great music of any kind. And um, going out, the most important thing to do, as you mentioned, Martha, is not to stay in your, in your place. 
but to get out and to be out in the community. And, and we've expanded to North, here in Chattanooga, to North Georgia and to all of Hamilton County and to Bradley County, where we will do either small concerts, concerts with a small group, or in, in some cases, we're able to take the full orchestra. Um, in the last 10 years, Kayoko, Dan, who's the music director, has uh, expanded upon that. And the, the quintets have started programs. They even do a, a now this year a mixtape uh, a presentation for the library, so mm -hmm. that the, their musical pre uh, presentations or their uh, the, one of the, the double reed players did a one hour session on how you make reeds for their instruments and demonstrated the reeds. They're in the available to the general public for free. Um, I do boot camps. They call them boot camps. They are basically adult education concerts, which I adore doing and where I basically tell stories. And as I said beforehand, I tell stories 50% of which are true. And then they have to guess which half I'm, I'm telling. It's true. But it, I, I've always loved that, that the idea of uh, talking about things that I love to people who love music. And there is, there is enormous joy for me, which is not what this is about, but hopefully if the joy that I have in sharing my, both my experience and my love of the music that I'm demonstrating, I think that that communicates and it creates the, the, the like experience for, for those that are listening. And I guess that's what I always try to do is what we try to do when we're playing or performing is to remember two things. One, that there's always someone in that audience who's there for the first time and has never heard an orchestra before. And the second, to communicate, to, to be there present and sharing what uh, what only music can do, and and we try to do it to as many diverse audiences as we can. A lot of what we do in music therapy, um, we don't just it's not just from a clinical standpoint, but it's from a social standpoint too. So you deal with a uh, uh, um, social, uh, clinical social psychology as it is, and you know uh, music. Even even the Romans understood how the right music at the right time can evoke the right sense of patriotism or you know the right the right sense of community and one of the great things about music is um, it's it's one of the few things where the community then is not necessarily designated by by our um, our um, demographics so the community is who's there right then participating or listening in, in whatever that is, that that's the community. And one, one of the things I used to look forward to mostly with the basketball band is, is uh, um, occasionally there, there would be some, some uh, uh, adults, well, um, some folks with uh, um, uh, special needs uh, at, at the games and they would kind of gather around the band. And what I started doing was putting them in front of the band to uh, conduct. And I figured, you know, if Bob can do it, anybody can do it. So, you know, I ran into uh, uh, one of the parents a couple years ago. You know, I haven't been director of bands since, uh, I guess it's 2012. Uh, but I ran into one of the parents a few years ago, and they, they shared with me how much their adult child looked forward to going to the game so they could stand in front of the band and conduct and participate. They're, they're participating. And at one point, uh, it might have been Orange Grove, but I think it, it also might have been Truesdale. At one point, we got a bunch of instruments uh, to put in the people's hands that were at the game. And, uh, when, and then they would stand around the, the band and, and they would play along with us. And that was it was so great for, for the students, for our students and for the community to, to just make music together.
you know, what an opportunity for people to, to just do something, to be human together. It's like it's music awesome. can be the, the ubiquitous essence that ties humanity together. And, and uh, um, we are learning now to take, to take more uh, uh, opportunities uh, than we used to. That's beautiful. One thing I didn't mention I, as I jump in, whether invited or not, is that the, we have we have done sensory friendly concerts with with the yeah. orchestra, starting with three year olds mm -hmm. and parents, and we discovered that the more the word got out on that, that that parents with children with with special needs, indeed, and we would have we would have parents with sixteen year olds coming to these concerts just just to be part of that experience and uh, it's it's uh, deeply rewarding from, uh, yeah. from for those of us on stage yeah absolutely absolutely so it, it's clearly a really powerful thing um you know you think about the conversation here and think why is this not more prevalent why is the money not there to, to get more sensory friendly concerts why are there not more programs going on in the medical field, in the educational fields um, to, to be able to do this. And I've been working on trying to advocate for this for close to 20 years now. And, you know, I went into it just saying, this is great stuff. This is wonderful. We're just going to do this. And I kept running into roadblocks as far as moving through it with what I'd call legislature or real, real use. And I've really come down to four basic reasons. Um, the first one is that I think music for therapy is really, um, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. And unfortunately, there was like the well-meaning um, research that happened in, I think it was 1993, that created the Mozart effect trend. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it just, you know, well-meaning, well-intentioned, it did a lot of damage and people think it's fraud, you know. And people, people then think, you know, okay, well, it's music therapy when, you know, the musicians are going playing at the hospital. Well, no, that's music enrichment. We just, you know, we need to educate a little bit more on that. Um, the second reason is that there's really not an advocacy group. Um, the American Music Therapy Association is, is the home corporate base for um, the music therapy groups in here in the United States. And we only have about 8,000 um, certified music therapists right now. So everybody is very busy with their clinical needs and going doing all this. And so there's really not anything set aside to do the things that you would relate to needing for a business. Now, I am not a business person, but in my, you know, in my work with going to university deans and hospital CEOs, the basic bottom line they want to know is what is it gonna cost and what's the cost effectiveness? And these studies unfortunately have not been done that much. Mm -hmm. So it would be really nice if, if you know, we could get some of the studies on that. Um, the science is out there, the third reason here, the science is out there, but a lot of it is still up in the upper circles of neuroscience and it hasn't filtered down onto the streets. We're in an educational kind of um, setting here in this country where there's a very familiar phrase called publish or perish. And so these amazing music researchers put out this incredible research and it gets published and then they go on to the next research. And so it never disseminates down. I mean, I have worked with amazing doctors trying to just say, you know, this is, this is so great, we need to do this. Um, neurologists who are world-class neurologists who said, wow, I didn't know this, this is really great. So it's not automatically filtering down. And the other thing I think that is happening is that groups tend to work with groups so that the doctors stay with the doctors and the musicians stay with the musicians and the educators stay with the educators. And we all need to sit and work together for this kind of thing to happen. The beauty, however, of using, of using music in medicine is basically a dream. You know, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's inexpensive, it's well tolerated. It's, uh, you know, has few side effects. There's great compliance in it, you know, and it's, and it's renewable. And it's basically the most impressive thing about it. It's patient dose regulated. 
you know, you take as much as you can tolerate, et cetera. Oh. And that basically, when you think about it, is the aim of any medication, you know, basically how much, because when we do the clinical trials to approve new medications, we, we basically give it a therapeutic value. But the beauty of, of, a, of, of a drug regimen is you want to use the least amount to cause the greatest impact. And, and music doesn't typically, or it's not mandated that it follows that rule. You know, there's no such thing that I know of, of over, overindulging in music. You know, there's very, very few side effects for it. And it's, it's available OTC. Since the pandemic, we have research that shows that online music improvisation helped improve and reduce feelings of loneliness and promote feelings of community. Um, what we're finding out is spontaneous group music making is associated with a number of, of benefits, even if the performers are not in the same room. And that's significant because th there's been recent studies with, with a group called Gow Improvisers Orchestra. They started global Zoom music sessions with musicians from all over the world. And those participating musicians reported uplifting benefits that were previously noted by musicians only playing in the same room. So basically technology, you know, possibly can come to the rescue. But I think that's very, very interesting. And it's an area of music that really has not been, you know, studied. And that's the impact of remote music. Well, it's been great being here with you two. I, I you three, sorry. I really, um, um, really have enjoyed uh, the camaraderie and, and uh, the, the fellowship from talking about music. It's really wonderful. I admire you all. And I'm really, really proud to be part of this. This has been great having you guys um, here. Like I said at the beginning, this is just the, the, the perfect group of wonderful people in medicine and music and education to sit and discuss all this. And this is exactly like I was saying, we need to all sit around the same table. This is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Let's the, hope that happens soon. I would love it. So Indeed. We can all bring our own, uh, you know, expertise opinions into it, and and I have great hope for that. So, um, I'm I'm so glad to be able to be a part of this, and uh, we'll be recording the the program with Mark and Richard, and having a wonderful time with that. And uh, you know, I, I hope you enjoy the whole process of listening to that also. And let me say at this point, I believe that Martha and her organization, Music Therapy Gateway and Communications are responsible for creating the positive music therapy, music cognition environment in the Chattanooga region. In fact, Music Therapy Gateway and Communications provided the foundational structure for the original discussion between Erlanger and UTC for the music therapy program. Their advocacy work with the medical, educational, and musical community created an opportunity for the introduction of UTC to our current director of music therapy Katie Goforth Albert. Since inception, our program has grown exponentially with students applying from all over the country, and we now provide services for several regional organizations. Among these are the Chattanooga Autism Center, CHI Memorial Hospital, Erlanger Hospital, Erlanger Behavioral Health Hospital, Goal Academy, Hamilton County Department of Education, Life Care Centers, Morning Point at the Lantern, the Children's Hospital at Erlanger, the Truesdale School, Therabi, and Siskin Hospital for Physical Rehabilitation. What UTC focuses on is music therapy. However, the region is well positioned to provide a center for inquiry in the realm of music cognition. I believe it would be beneficial to our educational and medical institutions to examine more opportunities for exploration in this fascinating area.